over there. So let us go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to our hangout on picture book submissions and the complete picture book submissions system that Emma and I have created. And I'm Julie Headland. Uh, I'm not going to go belabor introductions, but I'm Julie Headland. I'm a children's picture book author and founder of the 12 by 12 Picture Book Writing Challenge. Emma, do you want to just give a quick... Sure. And I'm Emma Walton Hamilton. I'm a children's book author as well as, and also a teacher of children's literature at the graduate school level and an editor. Yes, a very good editor, I might add. Um, one quick little housekeeping note of Google Hangout trick is... You'll notice that we shift depending on who's talking. So I'm pr big right now because I I'm talking, and when Emma was talking, she was big and we were small. If occasionally one of us might make a noise that in the middle of someone talking would shift. So if you want to keep the um, screen from moving from one person to the other, all you do is click on, like right now you might want to click on me, so that you you see me all the time and then when Emma starts talking you switch to her otherwise you can just let it switch back and forth but I just wanted to let you know that because that's distracting I've learned that's distracting for some people <laughs> okay so first I just wanted to talk a little bit about Emma and I and our story and how we came to be so passionate and doing so much work on picture book submissions when neither one of us are submitting picture books anymore. <laughs> um, and the reason is, through my work with 12 by 12, I help a lot of picture book authors, both with the, you know, the craft of writing as well as submitting. And I got to know Emma a few years ago and truly was just astounded at her gift with editing and helping with query letters. So much so that I started calling her the query whisperer because she really is magic. <laughs> and I've never seen anything like it. And um, so I invited her for two years in a row to do critique clinics for 12 by 12 members. The first year it was in our forum where people posted their queries and Emma posted comments. Last year we did video critiques of 50 query letters um, and after we were finished with that process, which was amazing, I mean, we just, the, the, the things that you see when you're looking at a lot of these query letters all at once is you start to notice, certainly there are individual things that come up that aren't necessarily the most common ones, so it's, it's helpful to point that out. But by and large, we see a lot of the same mistakes being made over and over and it becomes so clear what people struggle with and we sat down and we said why is that I mean there's so much information online about how to submit any kind of book including picture books just Google how to query a picture book and you're gonna come up with like pages and pages of information but what wasn't there was a comprehensive resource where you could go for everything you needed to know about picture book submissions, number one. And number two is while we were helping those individuals who submitted queries to us a lot, what we weren't feeling like we were doing was helping everybody and it was kind of frustrating to know that, okay, here are 50 queries and we saw, you know, all these mistakes and we've helped those 50 people, but we know that tomorrow 50, more than 50 more people are going to be sending submissions with query letters that have those same mistakes in them. And it kind of became our mission to uh, help people prevent that, to avoid it, because it's so easy to avoid if you know the rules and if you have all of those rules with you for every step of the process, because submissions are not just writing what you put in your query letter um, and the do's and don'ts, there's a lot more to it than that, and you really have to know what you're doing every step of the way 
because, as we say on the home page of our picture book submission system, you literally have two seconds. This is not a gimmick statement. You have two seconds to grab the attention in a positive way, or a negative way for that matter, of an agent or an editor. And Emma's going to talk about this a little bit more, but even more than that, chances are you're not even getting to the agent or editor you're querying to. Emma, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, and uh, I just want to echo everything that, that you just said, Julie, in terms of you know not being able, uh, part of our um, reason for doing this was because we were so aware that there wasn't one definitive resource out there that children's authors, picture book authors especially, could turn to for all the information. And I was finding in my own work as an editor, I have a, a freelance editing practice as well as a professor of children's literature, that every time someone asked me, you know, well, where can I find information about this or how can I learn about that, which is often I get asked that question, I was saying, well, you go here for this and go there for that and buy this book and go on to this website. And, and in the end, it was like, we've got to come up with a central resource where all of this information can exist in one place and, and make it easier on ourselves and make it easier on our colleagues, our fellow picture book authors out there. And what Julie says is true. Um, you know, the, the, the little known fact that I can share with you because I've, I've been published by three different large traditional publishing houses. I've spent a great deal of time in large traditional publishing houses and for six years we had our own imprint at HarperCollins and so I really was on the inside and I was able to sit in on acquisitions meetings and I was um, I was an editorial director and I was making judgments on queries and manuscripts and passing and and um, acquiring material while we were there and what I saw and what I continue to see every time I step into our current publisher's office is so much of the submissions process is actually managed and handled by an assistant rather than the agent or the editor themselves. And, and what this means is that there is a gatekeeper essentially that assistant's job is to weed out the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. And so you could have to, to spare their, their, you know, the agent or the editor that they're working for time. So you could have the most fantastic manuscript in the world, the most submission ready manuscript ever. And it's not even getting to the editor's desk or the agent's desk or, or meeting their eyes because the assistant flagged some mistakes in your query or picked up some typos or the query was too long or didn't follow the rules or whatever it may be that made them just automatically put it aside and move on to the next one. And every time I walk past one of those desks, I literally see two piles on every agent or editor's assistant's desk. There's the slush pile and then there's the little pile that's going to be taken into the agent or editor's office of the queries that made the cut uh, or the manuscripts that made the cut. And you want to be one of the ones that makes the cut and and not making the cut when you've poured your heart and soul into creating something. I mean, men are, let's face it, our, our, our stories are like our children. We've, we've nurtured them and we've raised them and we've, we've helped them become the best they can be and we put them out there in the world with all this faith and hope and to not make the cut because, you know, there was a mistake that flagged your submission as you know not ready to submit to the big guns, the editor or the agent, you know, is just heartbreaking. And more than that, it's avoidable. And so that's really what we want to talk about here today: is how to avoid those mistakes, how to make sure that you have followed all the rules, what those rules are, you know, and and um, how you can actually get the manuscript and the query in the hands of the right person so that you can move on to the next level of, of your process and your life as an author and, and become a published author and continue to, um, to build your career. That's right. One of our colleagues said something really funny today. Um, it, it, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, Emma and I have both done, get, got, done blog posts. Mine is on the exact same topic that we're talking about here. It's a real-life story of how a really bad query can prevent you from getting published. And it's my own story, and it's my own query. And 
it took me three years to recover from that bad query before that very book that I was submitting got published. And um, it was, if you want to go to my website at julieheadland.com, go to the blog, you'll see that. Emma wrote a guest post on Tara Lazar's blog about handling rejection, which is one of the units in uh, the Complete Picture Book submission system, which, you know, is kind of like the, the whole submission, a holistic approach to submissions process. And rejection is a component of the submissions process, and it's an important one because how you handle it and how you um, react to it is key in your future success. But our, one of our colleagues said something funny, which was how to handle rejection. That's easy. Stop getting rejected. <laughs> and, you know, ultimately, even though we include a unit on rejection in the system, ultimately, though, the goal is to actually get you that acceptance and to do it way faster than. Uh, say it took me by sparing yourself as Emma said these things are just so avoidable you just have to know what the rules are know how to apply them to every step of the process um, so with that I guess we can do uh, I did promise that we would give a tour of the picture book submission system so we can do that if folks want to do that first or do we have any questions that have come up already? Um, I'm looking. We've had a couple of you that have given us a great hint. And if you're watching this um, on the video screen, up by your name in the top right corner, there's a little grid. And if you click on that, there'll be an option to choose Q&A. And if you choose oh. Q&A, it'll show up in the right-hand screen, and you can type in your question so um, Julie and Emma can see it and answer it. So thank you, Helen and Moira, for your uh, for your tip there. And Emma, do, can you say something? Because on my screen, you look frozen. Oh, am I frozen? No, I'm, I'm no, here. I'm not frozen now. Okay. okay. You, you were frozen in your little box down there, but thankfully you're not frozen. I am not uh, frozen. Okay, well, it doesn't look like... <laughs> It doesn't look like we um, have any burning. We have any specific questions right now. So what there's we, a bit of a delay. So um, if you go ahead and show, that'll give people time to put their questions in. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a quick tour of this system that Emma and I have been talking about. I'm going to screen share, and. This is how we are going to get you from that big pile into the small pile. And ultimately into an even smaller pile, which is... Um, the acquisitions pile. The acquisitions pile or signing with an agent pile <laughs> a new, in the client list. Um, so this is the behind the scenes view of the complete picture book submission system. We have a welcome, and we show this on the home page, so if you want to go back and go to picturebooksubmissions.com, there is a video and, and uh, some text there that, will, that covers all this again, so you don't have to write this all down right now. But again, it is a step-by-step -step process, and you, have to, you really do have to start at the beginning, which is knowing who you are querying to an agent or an editor? Why are you querying that agent or editor? How do you research them? And I would just piggyback on that, Julie, and say this unit, um, unit one and two, digs really deeply into researching the right agent and editor for you because one of the things that, one of the other things I find that a lot of people don't realize is that a rejection by one editor at one publishing house or by one agent at one agency constitutes a rejection for the entire publishing house or the entire agency. That's so right. You want you you know once you've submitted to one editor at that publishing house, if that editor passes, that manuscript has been passed on by the entire publishing house or by the entire agency, not just by that one editor because the editor and the agent represent the house they work for. So this is why it's essential to choose carefully who, to whom you are submitting and to do your research and your homework and we really help you do that, figure out how to 
exactly identify the best possible fit for your work at any given agency or publishing house so as not to make that mistake. Right. Um, okay, in module in the second module, this is, you know, kind of a recipe for how to write a query letter, what goes in your query letter, and we even have templates that are practically, really they are fill in the blank, to get you started uh, writing a, qu a proper query letter. The, from the intro to your hook sentence, which is so key, your bio and market information in the conclusion, and then you see here in um, Unit 5, you know what I just realized? Um, it's not letting me... Click into the system? Yeah, because it doesn't recognize me as the... Right, let's, let's just keep moving through this description part. We can go back there later. Yeah, we'll go back because I wanted to show what's behind, what's within each of these units, and it thinks I'm not logged in. So... Um, well, I am not logged in, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> you can log in and when, when you stop screen sharing, and then we'll screen share and then again. And we'll go back again, yeah. yeah. Um, and I would just, here's another place that I would love to interject something and say that these components of a query letter are the essential components of, of every query letter. Um, we, we show you really specifically how to craft your hook sentence or your pitch with a bunch of templates and samples that you can kind of plug and play with your story. And we also dig deeply into how to build a bio um, and marketing information for your, for your manuscript and for yourself, even if you're not, even if you've never been published. Right. Which is, which is a distinction, you know, a question we get a lot is like, well, what am I supposed to put in my bio if I've never had anything published before? So we, we dig into that in, in a lot of depth. Exactly. And then with Unit 5 is where we take the, put, we literally put all these components together and provide you with two different templates for a query letter that you can essentially plug your information into. Um, and that, of course, that's after you've done the work of figuring out the content of these paragraphs. But we, we, you can, you will actually get query letter templates. This uh, module three is um, where we have the query critiques um, that that I talked about, the 50 video critiques. And what I'm going to do now is stop and see if we have any questions, so I can log in because this was one of the areas that we wanted to show you what's behind each of these, uh, what's behind some of these. So while you're not screen sharing, um, Julia, I'll just, I can see a question here from Vivian Kirkfield about the, the mistake that editors most often see in query letters. And, um, and I would just jump in and start answering that by saying there, there are many. <laughs> um, there are many really uh, common mistakes that editors see in query letters. One is um, that the query is too long and, um, and over, is overwritten and over-describing what the manuscript is about and so forth. And the reason that's such an important mistake is because, particularly with picture books, um, brevity is everything. And you need to be able to demonstrate that you understand um, the skills necessary to write with economy and to focus on getting your point across in as few words artfully chosen as possible. So a query that rambles um, is going to be a red flag for an agent or an, or an assistant agent or an assistant editor um, that the chances are the manuscript will ramble as well and uh, may not be ready. Um, another one is not personalizing the query, um, not, not not having identified a single agent or editor to whom you are submitting and why, um, but just sending it out generally to dear editor or dear agent or to whom it may concern. Um, th that's a real taboo in the industry these days. And um, it shows that you haven't bothered to do your homework and it, and it shows that you don't care enough to, to do the research to find the right fit for you. Do you have any that you would add to that, Julie? I would. I would add um, the not having a compelling hook. Yeah. It's the most difficult part of the query letter to write and by far the most important. And the, the thing that you have to realize about hooks and that some people will call a hook a pitch or a log line or so whatever definition you use, Elevators. you really need elevator pitch. Yeah. 
because that, when we talk about that two seconds, if you have a great hook, that's going to be the thing that just automatically gets you sent over to the small pile. And, and that is the thing. The hook is the thing that agents and editors, when they're reading your queries, will will pretty much jump to. I mean, that's the thing that if, if there was only one thing they're interested in in your entire query, it's going to be that, that single sentence or two that captures the spirit of your story without giving the whole thing away and in such a way as to um, pique their interest and make them want to read the entire manuscript. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Or the opposite. If they, if it's a hook that just doesn't draw them in and doesn't do anything for them or they're I'm not interested, they'll just set it aside. So I would say it's not so much a mistake as it is an, uh, an, an art of being able to write a good hook. And it's a mistake and if you haven't done that. If you haven't learned how to do it. And it, the thing is, it's also important to realize it's not just about, being able to write a good hook is not just about catching that particular agent or editor or assistant's eye at that given moment. It, that's obviously, you know, essential because it, you've got to be able to persuade them to want to read the story. But beyond that, it also demonstrates to them, and people don't realize necessarily this second component of the hook, it demonstrates that you understand your story well enough to be able to um, promote it effectively. And so the hook becomes the way in which, you know, being able to articulate a clear pitch and a clear hook for your story becomes a, a very strong message to an agent or an editor about whether or not you're going to be able to go out there and promote your story in, with a brief, potent, um, concise, clear, engaging, compelling pitch. Um, so so it, it's interesting, even though you're pitching the manuscript for publication with your hook, you're actually also preparing the way for the marketing that would take place and the promotion that would take place after the manuscript is published. Yeah, that is unfortunately very true because I think writing hook sentences is hard for everyone. And I ex expected after I got an agent that, maybe I won't have to do that anymore. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> as, as soon as uh, the, we get to the point where um, my agent thinks one of my books is sub submission ready, meaning ready to go out to editors, sh she'll say, what's the pitch? Can you put it in the pitch box? And then we have to go through until we get that perfect one that we feel comfortable with. So this is a skill. We just that did that last week, Julie, you and I. We together. did. In fact, oh, Emma, is, like I said, she, she is just magic. And I'm not going to share it with you because the book isn't published yet, but wow. I mean, she just, Emma is able to just, it's like a puzzle, and she puts all the pieces together, and then it's just spectacular. We'll be able to share because that, 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 that book is getting published anyway. <laughs> Um, um, can I throw something out there? Uh, as we've gone through and, and I've seen the all the material that you guys have in this is fantastic. And But the thing that strikes me is I think that not only does it help in writing your query, but I have to think that when you go to a conference and you're talking to agents and editors in person, doesn't it help focus your your message and what you're saying as well as what you're writing? Do you guys find that as without well? Without a doubt, without a doubt, Kelly. I mean, it is your pitch, essentially. And, and you know, whether it's, whether it's in print in a query letter or whether it's coming out of your mouth in an elevator when you've got 60 seconds, you know, with an agent or an editor or, or at a conference, I'm being facetious, of course, but, um, you know, it, it becomes your pitch and the better you know it and the f more familiar you are with it and the, and the more um, pithy you can make it, um, you know, it will, it will come out that way whether you're saying it or, or whether it's being read. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... want to go back and just clarify something because I can see a question here about the, what I said earlier about a rejection from an entire publishing house, you know, rejection from one editor being a rejection from an entire publishing house. And, and um, Sunny has asked a question, is that limited to that one story? And the answer is yes, it is limited to one story. Re remember that rejections are of manuscripts, not of authors. So um, when your manuscript is rejected, it isn't that you've been rejected, it's that that particular story or manuscript isn't the right fit at this time with that uh, publisher or agency. So yes, you can certainly query again with a new manuscript, but, um, but that manuscript unfortunately has now been passed on even, sadly, if you do a revision on it. Um, it's, it's an industry standard, unfortunately, that you know, unless you are specifically invited to submit a revision, 
um, that manuscript is no longer eligible for consideration at that particular house. Right. And if you choose to submit to a different editor at, a, at the same house, it has to be with a different manuscript. It right. cannot be with that manuscript. Same thing with the agency as well. So that particular manuscript is now gone from consideration. You can't use it there anymore. So that's, you know, again, why the submissions process really does, you really do want to take it seriously. It's very important. Um, and, and a follow-up question to that was, how long should you wait after a rejection to submit a different story to an agent or editor? And I'm assuming with that question you mean the, uh, different, the same agent or editor but a different story or a different editor or agent. And, you know, I think it depends on what your story is, whether it's a good fit. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to... I would say at, at least a couple months. I was going to say at least six to eight weeks. Yeah. So. Um, you know, you, you, you want to make it, you want to look professional. Um, you don't want to look desperate. Um, and above all, you want to look like you're serious about your career. And so you don't want to make it seem like you're just pulling, you know, queries and manuscripts out of a hat and, and flinging them out there. Well, you didn't like this one? Here, how about this one? You, know? <laughs> um, you want to make it look like you're really thinking thoughtfully and carefully about each project that you have and doing your homework and your research as to you know where that project might find the best home and um, and so you know ha making sure that you've given a little bit of breathing space between the time they've passed on one manuscript and the time you send another one demonstrates that you have gone back to the drawing board and you've thought it through and you maybe have done some further revision and you've thought about what that agency or editor you know is looking for right now and and polished this new manuscript to better suit those standards. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well I'm all signed in now, so I'm going to go back into screen sharing and showing some of the uh, meat infos behind the submissions system that we've been talking about. And we covered modules one and two, and here in the Query Critique Clinic is where we share the video query critiques that Emma and I did last year on behalf of 12 by 12 members. You can see, you know, each one of these videos is a good, you know, 40 to 60 minutes long. We go into huge detail on each letter. And what you also get here is a transcript of the video. So our, our, our comments that we shared back and forth are in a transcript. You have the queen, the queen, no, the clean query letter. Um, the, so here's queries one through ten, the clean versions. And then look at this. Um, we actually share the, if it will pop up here, we share our detailed comments in marked up versions as well. So depending on how you learn best, you can watch the video, you can read the transcript, or you could simply, okay, now it doesn't want to show me anything, um, or you could simply take the two queries side by side. I know a lot of people have said they read the clean query and they try to figure out what we're going to say, what, the, what we think the mistakes are, and then read the marked up query to sort of test themselves. So this unit all by itself is something that we've never seen anywhere else before. And most, a, a lot of the feedback and testimonials that we've gotten comment on how helpful this particular module is. And there's 50 of these. So I think it's safe to say that with 50 queries, we've probably managed to address every single mistake that anybody could make <laughs> in query letters. Um, and, and, you know, I will, I'll never say never, though, because there could be... And, and what we did here, in addition to Module 4, which is your top query letter do's and your query letter don'ts, we added another unit, which is the top 10 that we saw in this in these 50 queries, the things that we saw that just kept coming up the most often. In case you 
just want to get a quick glimpse into the learning, the main learning from this unit. Likewise, with Module 5, this is, I call it a beefy unit because there's so much in here. One of the most common questions that we get and something that really scares people a lot is that they're going to get the formatting wrong of the query letter or the manuscript and so forth. And what we decided to do was take every type of manuscript and query letter, etc., and just give you all of the specific instructions. So here you have general, just the general things that you want to think about and consider when you're formatting. Here is, and in here you have every, every one of these examples includes instructions for snail mail, even though it's hardly ever used anymore, but snail mail and email. And email with it as a Word document attachment and email with it in the body of the manuscript. So you'll see here a narrative manuscript formatting for snail mail and email. And I'm going to click on this really quickly because I want you to see how much information is in here. Um, here are the instructions. We give an exact precise example and it's written in a narrative format so you can see exactly how that works. And then you multiply that by we have narrative manuscript formatting, nonfiction manuscript formatting, query letter formatting, rhyming manuscript formatting, and script and dialogue manuscript formatting. And last but not least, this is a huge issue all by itself where we haven't seen comprehensive instructions before, which is how to format illustration notes. And we talk about when you should and shouldn't use illustration notes, and if you are, exactly how you want to incorporate those or put those into your manuscript. So that's just one unit in Module 5, formatting. So if you've ever had a question about how to format your manuscript, it's, it's in here. We, for illustrators, we give you instructions on how to submit sample illustrations, how much and how much is too much. And because this happens more often um, than you would think, we have a whole unit just on submitting after you've parted ways with an agent. It's common. It is not a black mark. This will not go down on your permanent record and there's a specific way you want to approach um, submitting after you've parted ways with an agent. The query etiquette. These are all of the things that uh, as you're submitting and after you've, submi you've submitted, how you handle, how long do you wait before nudging, what do you do if uh, we have more detail on rejections. But um, all of those questions are in, are in this unit. And then we have um, an FAQ, a comprehensive FAQs. And what we do with the FAQs is we promise you in the submission system that if you go through all the material and you have a question that isn't answered here, you send it to us and we'll not only answer it, but we'll add it to the FAQs. Because again, you know, our goal is to help everyone. And then we have, okay, you know, rejection is a very uh, is unfortunately just a part of the submissions process. You will get rejected. It's just a fact. Everybody does. Even after they have agents, they get rejected. So one thing that's important is to know how to interpret different kinds of rejection letters. And in this unit, we go into detail about what, if, if an agent says this or an editor says that, it really probably means this. And here's what you should do next. And that's in our dealing with feedback. And last, but certainly not least, we don't want to leave you hanging because part of the submissions process is ultimately being successful and getting a, an offer from an agent or a, an editor on a book deal. So we want you to know how to evaluate that offer. What you don't want to do is just have a knee-jerk yes reaction because you're so excited because this is a very important decision. This is maybe the most important decision you're going to make for your career. 
So we want you to know how to evaluate that offer, how to handle it um, in terms of etiquette, especially if you're going to reject an offer, and what to look for and what to look out for in contracts so that you are on your way to making an educated decision. Um, so as you can see, we start from the very beginning. Who do you submit to? Why? How do you research them? How do you find them? To how to write a query letter. Here's a whole bunch of examples of query letters and critiques, very detailed. Do's and don'ts. Now we're on to your submission, your actual submission, how you format it, how you, how you include illustrations, manners around submissions, frequently asked questions, what you do when you ultimately get rejection letters, how to go forward, and last, you've got your offer. Now what? So that is from start to finish everything that you would need in order to, to have a successful submission. And like I said before, you know, you can Google how to write a query. You will find dozens and dozens and dozens of blog posts on how to write a query letter. But then you have to know, okay, I've got the query letter. Now what do I do? Now what do I do? How do I send my manuscript? And what we wanted to do here was make sure that everything you needed was all in one place and not just for one submission but for every submission because if you're serious about your career you should be submitting often um, you should be submitting mul to multiple agents and editors and we talk about that in detail in I think it's in uh, module one submitting multiple submissions to agents and editors mm -hmm. alright I'm gonna stop I am going to guess that we have questions now. <laughs> we do. We do, and um, I, I'm, I just want to jump in. There's uh, one right uh, at the top from Karen um, who asks, if an agent or editor asks to see another manuscript, would you submit that additional work with a new query letter or simply send along the manuscript with a brief reply? And um, my answer to that would be you would submit it with a new query letter. It would be a slightly modified query letter, of course, you know, it wouldn't be an introducing yourself query letter. It would be thank you for requesting uh, additional an additional manuscript query letter. But you still absolutely must have that hook uh, information about this particular manuscript. Not necessarily the the uh, the same kind of here's who I am and here's why I chose you information because now you're in a dialogue. But you definitely want to have a query that demonstrates that you understand how this manuscript um, is structured and and that piques their interest uh, about that and gives them the confidence that you know how to promote it when the time comes. Absolutely, and that raises another good point, which is you really shouldn't be submitting unless you have more than one submission-ready manuscript. Right, this and is something else we address in the system. Pretty much, yeah, we talk about this. Um, because that is going to be the first thing that happens is they'll ask you what else do you have and when I was uh, qu querying when with negotiating with my agent she asked me okay I've seen this would you send me another manuscript and give me a list of other manuscripts that you have ready with their pitches and then I want a list of your works in progress with their pitches and the state of doneness, quote unquote. <laughs> and you know, so you really do want to be prepared when you get those requests instead and of going. They ask that is they want to know that you're not just a one book wonder. They want to right. know that this is not just a spontaneous, ooh, I had an idea for a children's book, I'm gonna see if I can get it published situation, but rather that you're somebody who's serious about pursuing a career as an author and uh, and who is, you know, who has a, a a portfolio essentially of work in development at various stages in development that you know they can that can represent a career for you and a career for them working in relationship with you. Right. Um, Nancy asks if we have results from people who've asked for our help and been published <laughs> and the answer to that question is absolutely yes. In fact, within those 50 query critiques so we can, th this is just direct from the system to success and from those 50 query critiques, two of them 
have taken the advice that we gave in those query critiques, revamped their queries, and signed with agents. And those are just the ones, those are just two that we know about. Um, Emma, I know you, through your uh, own critiquing, have vast numbers of success stories. And yes. certainly through 12 by 12, you know, we share success stories um, on a regular basis of people who have worked with us and gone on to get book deals and sign with agents or editors. Yeah, I was just going to say I have um, a number of students and editing clients, both, who have gone on to be published um, just this month, actually. Uh, one of my students, who is also an editing client, had her second book, uh, which happens to be illustrated by the very wonderful Peter H. Reynolds, um, published by Abrams. So uh, she's really she's really out there, making her career now, and I'm, I feel like a midwife. I, I feel like <laughs> uh, it's so great. But there are a lot of those examples. Um, this specifically, though, those examples speak to people that we've worked with before launching this picture books submission system because, of course, the submission was only launched just a few days ago. So right. um, we're, we're looking forward, very much looking forward to hearing about all the success stories that come about as a result of this new system. Right, but even just within those qu video query critiques, we had a couple yeah. of success stories. Yeah. And the other thing, I, the other point I want to make about this question is, it's important whenever you are seeking information or advice about publishing, submitting any aspect of it, whether it's craft of writing or how to submit or what to do, you know, how to handle relationships with your agent or or whatnot. It's so important to consider the source of the information because there is so much information available online. And Emma and I can speak to the fact that that's actually part of why we created the system because there's, it's just you can get into overwhelm easily. Well, and then there's also a lot of erroneous information. Well, that's what I mean. There's a lot of, or it, you know, an, an author... I took some bad advice early on, and you'll see that if you go and read my post from Monday. And uh, the other thing, too, is even if the source is a good one, you also have to consider their perspective. So, for example, I've gone to conferences where an agent will give a talk on how to write a query letter, for example. And for the most part, that's going to be good, solid advice by and large. But this agent also has a perspective on what they like to see, what they themselves like to see in a query letter, which may be different from what agent B, who's in another room talking about something else, wants to see. And one advantage here is that through 12 by 12, you know, I book 20 agents a year who accept picture book manuscripts and communicate with them and talk to them about what they're looking for, what they're not looking for, how submissions work for them. I always check in to see, get their thoughts on uh, the submissions they're receiving. And same thing with Emma, works with dozens of agents and editors through uh, Stony Brook Southampton and the Children's Literature Fellows. And so we bring a, a, a global perspective to that, a more global perspective. Wouldn't you say, Emma? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also in the in the system, um, we do talk about you know there are there are a couple of um, common ways in which agents differ in how they'd like to uh, receive a query, and we talk about you know choice A and choice B, and how to determine which is the best choice to make for your manuscript and for the agent that you're querying. So um, we also do give you some of the tools to consider and to factor in when when you know trying to make that decision. Right. But there are all kinds of people who are out there at all different stages of publishing, writing articles on submissions. And so whether you uh, end up having the submissions system or not, please just make sure that you're always able to verify the quality of the source of the information you're taking before you take on that advice. Um, if you blog, is it acceptable to include a reference to it in a query letter, and how much should you include about Twitter handles and social media accounts? And 
honestly, Catherine, we have a whole unit on this very topic, which is bio and market information. And we cover it in huge amount of detail, and it's something in particular that, you know, for me, I have, was an author with a platform when I was submitting and um, have pretty strong opinions about it. It's too long of a question for, for me to answer, uh, for us to answer with just, you know, five minutes left in the Hangout. But what I will say is the one thing I will say that I think is the most important, and then, Emma, you can add, add yours, is don't include it if it's not relevant to your writing, like directly relevant. If you have a blog and it's about, you know, the <laughs> topsoil erosion problem and you're not writing about topsoil erosion in your picture book, then it doesn't count. And by and large, unless you're, 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 the number of your followers and all that is gigantic, you don't need to provide specifics on them. You can include links in your signature to your website, your blog, etc. But the agent is going to Google you. Just know that. They will. Having said that, though, I would hasten to add that you, you should never expect an agent to go to your website, for example, to read your manuscript. Yes. Or... And that was a mistake I made in my query that I shared on Monday. Hello. <laughs> some of my other work here and right. yeah, yeah. fill out this form go, yeah here now that you're right. now that I have you okay. hang go here to see on. Here's, here's a really good question from Deborah what do you do if your critique group wants you to do one thing and a freelance editor is recommending oh. another path that's another that's an easy one it, well that's first of all if your freelance editor is Emma you do what Emma says <laughs> every time well I would pretty much say for the most part, you know, for if your freelance editor is a legit editor and a legit with with a you know a, a, a credible creditable profile in the industry and then a good deal of experience specifically with children's literature, um, I would always listen to an editor over a critique group. A critique group, you know, even if it may be filled with published authors, um, generally speaking that advice is going to be leavened by a lot of variables and uh, and a freelance editor has no other agenda other than to provide you with the best most uh, factual information they can so when in doubt listen to a freelance editor yeah and it speaks to the again the broadness you know a freelance editor works with many 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 different manuscripts your critique group has probably seen far fewer manuscripts in their lifetimes even collective lifetimes but again it also speaks to the source and where did you find this freelance editor who who else have they worked with um, you know if it was just a you know find your editor here dot com maybe you know your your critique group, but like like Emma says, I I would have to say probably nine times out of ten you're going to go with what the freelance editor says, and that's that a, is, that's an important distinction though, especially if you are um, even remotely considering um, self or independent publishing, because a lot of these self publishing organizations profess to have editors in house who may or may not be um, really experienced, skilled, gifted editors specifically with picture books for instance so it's very important to, to make sure that the editor that you're working with has the right credentials and two of the best resources I know of for that are the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators SCBWI maintains a list of freelance editors, children's book editors that they endorse um, and if you're a member you can have access to that list it's available through their website and um, the Editorial Freelancers Association um, is another organization the EFA.org um, that provides a list of accredited, you know, established editors. So I would go there before going to like Elance.com, for instance, or just you know, um, finding a, an editor through a through a self-publishing house or something like that. And um, I'm going to take uh, do, do these last questions really quickly, and then I'm going to ask if um, you don't submit questions. Stay on the line because we, we have some important things to share, but um, we are getting toward the end. If you have a burning, burning, burning question that you just live without the answer to, um, put it in now. Um, Danny says, how soon should you submit a second manuscript after it's requested? And the answer is, 
whenever that manuscript is ready. But as um, soon as possible. As soon as possible, but make sure it's ready. So my own agent actually felt so passionately about this when she was taking 12 by 12 uh, submissions because she got stuff that came back to her. This is, was more about revisions. If you're asked for revisions, it actually really looks bad if you send those revisions. Well, that's true. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're being asked to submit a second manuscript and your a manuscript is ready, you send it, like right then. Um, this actually just came up this week. One of my 12 by 12 members said, oh no, an agent is interested and wants another one, but it's not ready, what do I do? And I wrote back, be honest, tell her you have something in progress and it's not quite ready yet and could you send it on when it is? And of course the agent is happy to permit that. So Emma's right. For when they request more work, you send it immediately if it's ready. If it's not ready, you let them know and give them some kind of estimate as to when it will be and then you get your butt in the chair and you start working on it. Um, if you're asked to revise and resubmit, then you take your time on those revisions and just get it right and send it back to them when it's right. And by time, I, we mean at least three weeks. Yeah. Because you don't, again, you don't want to look desperate or needy and you want to look serious and professional. And you want to make sure that you didn't just, you know, you want to show them that you didn't just sit there and bang out some, some revisions quickly and throw it out there to see what they thought, but that you really thoughtfully, carefully went through the revision process and made it the best it could be before resubmitting. Right. Okay, quickly, um, we did an Sherry, we did answer this question early on. This recording will be on my YouTube channel, so you, um, Kelly, if you want to provide that link in the chat, you'll be able to go back, but the bottom line was you need a great hook sentence and you don't want it to be too long. Those are the most common mistakes. Um, and we can't talk about writer's block today because it's out of scope. And quite honestly, I think we all suffer <laughs> enough from that and have different ways of dealing with it. Um, so before we conclude our hangout here today, we just want to tell you, make sure you know that there are two days left to purchase the Complete Picture Book Submission System. And after that, we'll be closing it to the public. And the reason for that is we want to, we've had a lot of new people joining and um, we want to be able to focus on the new members and providing service to them. We've also included it as one of our VIP bonuses, which we didn't even talk about today. I mean, we talked about the system and we didn't even talk about the bonuses that we have included, one of which is Emma's amazing webinar that she gave in January on how to know if your picture book is submission ready. So that's even kind of before you get started on, on all of what is in the submission system. Um, somebody asked the platform question. So we have another bonus with, that features an interview between Emma and author platform guru Jane Friedman, along with a follow-up discussion with Emma and me talking about author platform. And again, those videos include transcripts as well. And Emma, and we have a list of publishers who accept unsolicited manuscripts as one of our bonuses that's updated every six months. And last but not least, in, in mid-month, we're going to do a live session, a live Q&A session just for members of the submission system with Emma and myself so we can make sure that whatever questions you have about using it are answered or whatever, if there are questions that you have that you don't see there, that you will um, get those answered. So in order to do all this and do it really well, we're closing down the um, the shopping cart. Yes, thank you. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> we're closing the cart at 6 o'clock p.m. on Friday, March 6th. So yeah. you really, if you're serious about submitting, you really can't go wrong, uh, honestly, with this system. And um, if you have any other questions, you can email support at picturebooksubmissions.com. Is that the right address, Kelly? And yes. also, um, if you want to go check out the, sub the system, um, it is picturebooksubmissions.com. And I can put that in the, oops, 
Am I still screen sharing? No. No. Okay. Um, so again, it does, if you if you have the world's most wonderful manuscript, don't let it end up in that big yucky pile that gets thrown away. <laughs> um, don't, Emma, let it, have, don't let it be passed over because of you know a, a mistake, an avoidable mistake that uh, you know shows up in a query letter that didn't need to be there. Exactly. Exactly. Um, anything else, Emma? Any final last minute, last minute questions? No, other than just wishing all of you great good fortune with your manuscripts and your submissions. Yeah, we really, really do want to help you avoid the the mistakes, and we just we see them over and over and over again. And the the fact that they're so preventable <laughs> is um, what we are trying to solve most of all in uh, the picture book submission system. But we thank oh. you for. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I'm not sure we mentioned this, but we, um, in addition to the to the hangout that we'll be hosting in mid-March um, to answer questions of people who have actually um, bought and are working with the system, we've also um, guaranteed that if your question isn't answered in the system itself, um, if you send it to us, we'll answer it, and then we'll include that in the materials um, going forward of the system. So Right, right. Absolutely. So thank you, everybody. You guys asked some great questions. And if you were here, we're assuming that you're either submitting or about to start submitting. And so we wish you all the very best of luck. And with that, we're going to close down. Signing off. <laughs>